Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again. And now, on to the story. Percussive, written by Hicks Kem. My people have always been neutral. We take no sides in any conflict save those that directly involve us. We do not expand our territories except into those regions which are unclaimed by any sapiens even those not yet reaching towards the stars. We prefer to observe the other species, to learn of their behaviors and technological advances and artistic and cultural achievements. In short, we are what you might call a race of historians. It is this fundamental aspect of our nature that should lend credence to the following information. We are, collectively, breaking our own self-imposed neutrality to offer advice to the Galactic Council regarding the newcomer race known as humans. We observed the earliest attempts at spaceflight, much of which seemed to be driven by faction disputes and claims of global supremacy. They managed to arrive at the local satellite in a remarkable time after their first successful outgoing transmission. However, they did not bring any advanced equipment with them on their trip. This may seem irrelevant, but the Council should understand that this is a fundamental point in the human species. Their willingness to attempt something without full preparation is not unseen in the galaxy. However, most of the races that exhibit such behavior drive themselves to extinction long before achieving spaceflight, occasionally taking the rare gem of a viable life-supporting planet with them. These humans seemed poised to do the same thing during the half-improvised leaps from their world. We observed as they flung themselves at their satellite a few times and then to appear to get bored with the whole thing. We observed as they tossed automated drones at their inter-system neighbors. On one such attempt, multiple factions were involved and nobody thought to ensure their uniform system of measurement in the process. We must confess our race find that to be quite uh, hubris. Their records indicate the planning had taken years, the launch and subsequent travel another year or so, and the landing approximately a minute and a half. Still, they continued their behaviors rather than plan for contingencies. They adapted subsequent attempts to the failures of the previous. We explain all of this here to establish the consistency with which humanity attempts advancement without preparation. More recent observations of their space travel behaviors has yielded some new and surprising pieces of information. Humans have long squabbled between themselves over the proper use of resources, and as such have developed the ability to draw out the functionality of what is available well beyond any capacity that we would ordinarily see. They travel with little to no redundancy in their systems, and often do not have replacement parts to hand. Still, they bounce from star to star, looking and searching for ever more colony-worthy worlds. One of our researchers managed to get a nanoprobe into one of their ships and maneuvered it all the way to the engine room. I sat there for nearly eight days, recording and transmitting events that were, frankly, quite shocking. After analysis, we determined that the humans were using technologies we believe to be wildly incompatible to improve the efficiency of their shields and engines. The kinetic energy of a shield impact was absorbed and stored for later use as propulsion and system support back through their engine. In terms that the Council may more readily appreciate, every particle of space dust they hit simply refueled their fuel stalls, save for travel between galaxies. Such a system would allow nearly endless travel. It was absurd, more to the point, yet was improvised. This is not a standard technology aboard the ships. This was the work of one of their engineers attempting to reduce his workload by redirecting power overflow from the shield system into the engines, 
thus reducing the amount of time he'd have to spend changing fuel cells. Any other race would have likely exiled the individual for such laziness and dereliction of duty. The humans gave the engineer a medal and a celebration. One might be inclined to think this engineer was obviously a savant who was using the travel as an opportunity for highly advanced research testing. One would be very wrong. The same engineer was observed in the same recording striking the engine with a large blunt object in excess of 20,000 runs of force. As he did, he insisted to a counterpart in the room that all it needs is the occasional percussive maintenance. We scoured our records for additional references to this concept. Maintenance using short bursts of sonic energy was previously unknown to us, yet the humans have countless recorded events of this percussive maintenance being more effective than the considered and deliberate analysis of the mechanical fault. One such individual in the recordings, known as the Fonz, demonstrates considerable expertise in this field. Although the individual tends to focus his efforts on entertainment devices and personal transports. As a final point, and the main reason we address the council today, a reminder that humans go everywhere unprepared. For instance, their ships do not travel with onboard weaponry, no kinetic launchers, no plasma cannons, no heavy photon artillery, nothing of the sort. And yet, when one of their ships was assaulted by the Kadrian raider, the attackers were utterly destroyed, and the humans merely continued onward. We observed several similar attempts by the Kidrians to take the human vessel by ever-increasing force. Each time, the humans emerged unscathed and uninterested. After the sixth such encounter, we breached long-range observation protocols and performed an examination of the wreckage of the Kidrian vessel. We dispatched six different independent research teams for error reduction, and they returned nearly identical conclusions. Though no visible contact had been made between the ships, the Kudrin vessel and everything inside of it had been physically crushed. We immediately issued an alert to all of our observation platforms and examination ships to maintain a non-aggressive distance from all human vessels and to flee at any sign of hostile content. We would offer these humans no reason to consider us a threat. We continued our observations for some time after, gathering data as another ship passed through the asteroid field. It was there that we gained the most valuable insight. We examined our recordings over and over again, before finally understanding what the humans were doing. Their shield emitters were designed to be tuned to a radius that suits the need. They aren't prepared for a specific radius, they are prepared to adapt to all necessary radii, given the threshold of energy available. Thus, they simply use their shields to shove things aside. To be clear, this is a rapid process. The expansion of the shield radius is similar in dynamics to a supernova, albeit on a smaller scale. At such an expansion speed, larger objects such as ships act as nearly stationary objects while the smaller objects namely the beings inside the ships, are tossed about rapidly. These sudden changes in position result in the crushing effect that we observe. We confess our curiosity got the better of us, and we examined the behavior for patterns. Once we had discovered the rather unique pattern, one built of lower frequencies following a steadier rhythm in the middle and higher frequencies showing more variance. We broadcast a crude facsimile in the direction of one of their ships. What followed was our own first contact with humans. They approached us slowly, their shields never wavering, and we maintained weapon style status. We had the opportunity to engage in open communication between our species, and we took it. The leader of the ship 2112 introduced himself as Harris, and his first words to us were, So you guys like Rush, huh? We were confused. Harris explained that they had picked up the broadcast of music and understood it to mean that we were friendly. We were treated to a full cultural exchange with the humans, who readily gave us copies of every sample of this music that he could access, then gave us the coordinates and access codes for additional samples. In conclusion, it would seem that the humans are highly adaptable species that functions on two major principles. First, 
Any challenge can be overcome if you shove hard enough. Second, any culture can always use more music. It is, therefore, our neutral and unbiased recommendation to the Council that those with ill intent should avoid humans to the best of their ability, and those with amicable intent should bring their species' musical collection to any first contact proceedings. End of story. Story number two. You, written by Luharia. 463 Terran years ago, to the day you attacked us. You attacked us. A civilization that was yet to even reach the stars. We did not understand why. What had we done? What could merit such a preemptive strike? The murder of our children. The decimation of our cities. The genocide of our civilization. We could not understand. War, we understood. War, we perfected. We practiced war for millennia before you arrived. If you had attacked us for territory, or resources, or slaves, we would have understood. But you did not. You saw. You came. You conquered. And you left. You didn't enslave us. You didn't exterminate us. Or at least you thought after rebuilding our society, and only after decades of analyzing your communications, did we realize while you had attempted to wipe us away from the face of the earth, you decided that our potential for violence was far too great to risk your empire and your civilization. You taught us that the galaxy is cruel. You are the reason for the conquest of your little compact. You are the reason that we come out of our system seeking war. You are the reason for your own demise. You thought us rash. Thought us greedy. You thought us violent. You thought us cowards. For centuries we have lain in wait. For centuries we have expanded. Any of our 14 planets could rival your entire empire. While you learned peace, we remastered war. While you grew complacent, we lay hidden beneath your very eyes. We developed technologies that your best minds couldn't even dream of. We modified the very strings of our beings to better destroy you. We are the Legion. And today we end the war that you started half a millennia ago. Today we come back from the grave to avenge our ancestors, fallen brethren. You barely won against them. You will lose to us. Today we condemn you to extinction. Today we avenge terror. Today we will teach you the meaning of of Armageddon. Broadcast from all Legion ships on the day of their arrival in the home worlds of the Compact of Sharti. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one. And until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.